The views and content expressed on the following program are provided solely for informational and entertainment purposes. They do not constitute legal advice. A podcast is not a substitute for retaining a competent, licensed attorney to advise you on your specific legal situation. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. It is time for Break the Business, where we empower indie creators and have some fun along the way. I'm Ryan Carella, and it is a pleasure to have you here this week. Let me tell you all something, viewers and listeners. We live in a world where there is a seemingly infinite amount of music that we can listen to at any given time. At a, at a touch of a button, these magic rectangles, these phones can let us listen to any song that's ever been made a countless cornucopia of music to listen to and until then i thought we needed all of that music but i've now come to discover that the only song we need the only song that we ever need to listen to forever and ever dare i say perhaps the greatest work that has ever been created by mankind is of course the new Jack Black song, Peaches, from the Super Mario Brothers movie soundtrack. Mwah, mwah, two chef kisses. What a masterpiece. I'm obsessed with this song, and I continue as I have my love affair and my obsession with one Jack Black, who just has graced us with so many fantastic works of art. I cannot get enough of this song. I can't wait to go see this movie. I don't know if our co-host this week, Katie Zaccardi, is familiar with this piece of art. Katie, have you heard this song? <laughs> of course I've heard Peaches, Peaches, Peaches. Can we play it? <laughs> Are we allowed to play it or no? Um, Jack Black seems like the kind of dude who would be chill enough to not care about that much about copyrights. However, I imagine the folks at Nintendo are probably more than a little litigious. So oh, that's true. That's true. But yeah, I'm a big fan of that song. Oh God, he's he's so so great, and I just I mean, he has the same kind of thing that um, Donald Glover has in my view, where the fact that those two people can be equally good at both music and at acting and comedy and just be at yeah. the very, very top of both. And, you know, you, you put them in your top five in either. And in just, and it's just, it's, it's just continues to be mind blowing. Like I obviously yeah. love ten, tenacious D and all the stuff that he did there. And just, I, I almost forgot that he's just this spectacular musician. Cause he hasn't put out a lot of music in a while, not since what school of rock. And that was more than 10 yeah. years ago. And then this yeah. song came out and it just makes me more excited than ever to go see this movie, which I still have not seen yet. Yeah, I haven't either. And I really had no interest in seeing it. I'm not going to lie, but I will do anything for Jack Black because he <laughs> is the best. Because and... we must protect him at all costs. <laughs> yeah, I love him literally so much. And I think it's so funny how he fully embodies anything that he is doing. So and he's We're... definitely embodying this. Were you a Mario player at all, Katie Zaccardi? You played any of the games? So I was like more of an Animal Crossing girl growing up. And I did play a little bit of Mario, but it was mostly just Mario Kart. Or wait, what's the one? What's the one where you, it's like a, I was going to say, it's like a game. Yeah, they're all games. <laughs> Are you talking about Mario Party? Mario Party, yeah, I think that's what I'm talking about. Where it's like you go like around kind of a board game, right? Yes, Mario, yeah. Mar Mario. I, I'm obsessed with that game. Yeah, okay, so I, I, I guess now that I'm saying it, I did play a decent amount of Mario, but I, I don't ever feel like it was like the traditional kind of Mario. You know what I mean? I have a confession to make with respect to Mario Party, and I want to preface this by saying I'm not going to do it on this week's show because I don't remember all of the words, but about. 10 or 11 years ago, like in, in an old podcast that I used to do with uh, Evan and Elisa, who, you know, who co-hosted this show in the past mm -hmm. and JC, who's been a co-host on the show in the past. Uh, we did a comedy podcast together, you know, many moons and many hair follicles for me ago. And on one of the episodes of that show, I actually wrote and performed a love song about Mario Party because wow. years ago on YouTube, this person created a Mario Kart love song. Okay. 
and you know about falling in love with somebody while playing Mario Kart. And I was like, no, no, no. The real falling in love game is Mario Party because it's like a board game and it's sweet. It takes time and and yeah. um and to this day, I think it's like the only actual song like I've ever written start to finish because mm -hmm. I'm not a songwriter and I'm unusually proud of this song. <laughs> And so if That's people so are interested, because I don't know if there's a market for this, but if people are interested, if if y'all give me like a few weeks, maybe the next time Katie's on this show, I can take some time, remember the words, figure out how to play it. And I might be able to grace everybody with the Mario Party love song in honor of the new Mario Brothers movie, which I am very excited to see. I would love to hear that there personally. <laughs> Well, there's a lot to be excited about this week as well. In addition to seeing your smiling face, Katie Zaccardi, which always brings me joy, <laughs> we got a, a fantastic pair of guests this week. We're going to be joined this week by Tony Glazer and Summer Crockett Moore. Uh, I'm about to tell you what they do, but I want to give Lauren a chance to grab her headshots and her sides. They are film producers. So now Lauren's going to go sprint and find her audition materials. They are amazing film mm -hmm. producers, and they are also the founders of the Below the Line Boot Camp, which is a free not-for-profit program that provides job training for underserved and at-risk individuals to get them jobs in below-the-line roles in the film industry. How cool is that? That is cool. What does below the line mean? Oh, there you go. Well, that's something that uh, Tony and Summer could probably answer for you, but I'll give you the less okay. informed answer, right? Okay. So like in, in a in a film of I, I guess it's on like the film block or whatever, like the the big role, like the, the top roles, like the director, producer, those, those are all above the line. Right. Uh -huh. And then below the line are the the grips, the uh, props, people, costume designers. And a lot of which these jobs can be very lucrative. Uh, the yeah. ones who are very good at these jobs can continue to get work for on and on and on. And. How cool is it that we got uh, Tony and Summer out there providing these opportunities for at-risk individuals, for disadvantaged kids to get jobs in this industry, to get into this industry? Because it's obviously very much a who-you-know kind of thing. So when two prominent producers like Tony and Summer get together and become the who-you-know yeah. for these kids to give them the training, to give them the exposure, to give them the connections, it's a lot to love. I can't wait to talk to them all about it. That's so funny that we were just talking about Nepo babies right before this, <laughs> completely unrelated, right before we went live. And yep. and now this is like the beautiful opposite of that, helping people who don't have that Nepo baby privilege to yeah. get where they need to go. I love that. It definitely fits within the spirit of this program, right? We yeah. we strongly endorse the idea of wanting to create opportunities for as many indie creators as possible to democratize this industry, to make it so that the best, hardest working creators out there, whether they come from privilege or they come from disadvantaged backgrounds, can share their art with the world. And we obviously love that Tony and Summer are our brother and sister in arms in that particular endeavor. And they've, they they put their production company on the line for this. They They lend their time, they lend their effort, they lend their resources. It's a lot to love. Yeah, we're going to talk to them all about it. We got a lot of great news in the meantime, though, before we bring them in. A lot of uh, exciting stuff to talk to you about. We, of course, want to start things off by giving a nice piece of advice for all the indie creators out there with our AI Overlord Tip of the Week. AI Now, Katie, we have heard with one loud and clear voice from our viewers and listeners that they do not want any more chat GPT movie quotes from our AI overlord tip of the week. Why? Uh, apparently, we have done that bit into the ground. And uh, we've... I, am I still thinking about our Moulin Rouge one? Yes, but I will <laughs> forgive the listeners. <laughs> The Moulin ah! Rouge one was really the peak of that, I think. Okay, because it was the best one. They said, we can't go any further than this. Like, it's the best one you ever did. Just, I understand. Yeah, no, absolutely. When you, you, when you, you hit perfection, you don't want to mess with it. So You inspired the best <laughs> Chad GPT inspired movie <laughs> quote tip of the week. They still love our AI overlord. Nobody is going to cross our AI overlord. They Phew. all love they all love the overlord. They just want to see the overlord do different things with the advice that it gives, okay? Okay, so what is Chad up to this week? 
So Chad is uh, is up to something pretty interesting. So I I tasked Chad GPT to give us a piece of advice about the importance of getting your contracts in writing as an okay. indie creator. But rather than just tell Chad GPT, give us a tip about getting your contracts in writing. Boring. Yeah. I thought to myself, maybe Chat GPT or Chad, as you have dubbed him, <laughs> can tell us about the importance of getting your contracts in writing by having us talk to perhaps the greatest master of the written word in all of human history. And that is William Shakespeare. Shakespeare, I thought, I thought you were going to say that. So I, okay. we have asked our AI overlord to give us a tip of the week from William Shakespeare okay. about the importance of getting your contracts in writing. Now, if we're going to have a Shakespearean piece of advice here, I think it's only fair to perform it a little bit. So um, I, I, I will try my best to be the to interpret the great words of the bard here. OK, let wow, me, let me get into a little bit of a costume here. This is getting fancy. Yes, you know, well, you know, like we, we have to do the bard's words justice, you know? Yeah. So, you know, get a little robe here. Uh, maybe a, maybe a little music to kind of set a, a Shakespearean scene a little bit while we do our while I perform this chat GPT inspired AI overlord tip of the week about the importance of getting your contracts in writing. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, indie creators whose ventures bold do strive to grasp the future's glowing mold. Attend my words, a counsel I bestow, a tip of the week all prudent minds should know. In realms of art where passion doth command and eager hearts with dreams of fame expand, tis off the case that trust and honor bind. Yet in this trust, deception snares we find. To guard against the wiles of fickle fate and fortunes lost to cunning tongues that bait, I urge thee now, in contracts written well, to find security and strife to quell. For in the ink and on the parchment's face lies clear intent, disputes to soon erase. And in these words, where promises are sworn, a bond of law that breaches shall not scorn. O oh, indie creators! Heed this sage advice, and in your dealings net, let no trust suffice without the weight of written words to prove the terms to which all parties do approve. For in these clauses, artfully composed, your rights, your claims by law shall be enclosed, and in this wisdom may your works be sound with just reward and honor's wreath unbound. Wow. I really needed that music to fade out there. <laughs> Didn't do it. <laughs> the production value on this show has just gotten gone way, way, way up. I was not we're, prepared. We're really blowing the budget apart here. All right. <laughs> I really wanted to do my best for that. I love um, that. For two reasons. One, we have a couple film producers waiting in the <laughs> green room. And I'm not going to miss out on an opportunity to get cast in something. Ryan's going to make his big break. And secondly, I'll tell you this little secret. Behind every entertainment lawyer lies the soul of a theater kid trying to get out. So, Ain't that the <laughs> truth? Well, I love that. Very, very creative and well done tip of the week. Good Thank you. performance and good sentiment. <laughs> And and there's real insight behind it too. This is a uh, I, I'll close by talking about the importance of written contracts by giving. I don't know if we've talked about this on the show before, but it's always worth bearing repeating because we always have new people coming in, discovering the show on Sirius XM and everything. But when artists tell me why do I need to get a contract in writing, the terms here are very simple. They're very basic. I do the thing, they pay me. Why does that need to be in writing? You know, why, why do we need, why do I need that protection? We all know what the terms of the deal are. We all have a clear understanding. And what I reply to them with is the idea of what we all think the deal is, is going to be very much in the eye of our beholder. And chances are the way you see the deal is very different than how somebody else sees the deal. 
even if you think that the deal is simple. Uh, an example, you ever play the board game Monopoly? Yes. Yes. Um, question for you, Katie Zaccardi. What happens in Monopoly when you land on a space known as free parking? I don't know because I'm really bad at Monopoly. Will you please tell me, Ryan? Well, I have played versions <laughs> of the game. Well, actually, here, let's let's get producer Lauren in here on this because she's she we have played many of a Monopoly game together. Lauren, what happens in Monopoly <laughs> when you land on free parking? You're supposed okay, depends <laughs> on which rule set you're playing by. But there are the people who have the two hundred dollars. There are the people who collect everything in the middle, which was us, right? So like when you collect taxes and things like that, they all go into the pool in the middle. And uh, or was it like five hundred? You get two hundred when you pass, but you get five hundred <laughs> if you land on it, right? But if you land on it, you get everything in the pot in the middle that's been collected over time. Mm, so you can okay. make like a big cash in. So yes, there are. <laughs> I, have, I have been. I have been at houses where somebody puts like five hundred dollars in the middle of the board. Mm -hmm. And if you land on free parking, you get the $500 or it's $200 or it's as Laura noted, every time anyone lands on luxury tax or uh, has to pay the utility or whatever, you take all that money, you put it in the center of the board. And if somebody lands on free parking, you get everything on the board. And there are people who say that nothing happens when you land on free parking. It's free parking. Nothing happens. And what and what I think the free parking example shows us is the problem with oral contracts, because whatever house you go to is so sure that they know the rules about what happens on free parking. And when you tell them something different, that's how fights start. If only there was some written document somewhere out in the world, perhaps in the Monopoly box, dare I say, that okay. could tell us what the hell happens when you land on free parking. And in fact, there is. And you know what those rules say? What? Nothing happens. It's free parking. Okay, hold on. That's been updated, though. Because if you read it now, it's like Uno, right? There's not like a, a book. Oh, I was There's just not like thinking of Uno. Original rules. And then it says like house rules. And then it has like variations. Like they've happened so much culturally that they're in the instruction manual now. It's like you can hit whatever it is like as many wild cards as you want or you can only hit a wild card if you have no other cards and you can only do one draw two or you can make them draw for eternity so like mm. those things happen they, you're, they evolve you're a nightmare the rules <laughs> there is a there is a there is okay, a clear brutal. there is a clear <laughs> set of rules and it says nothing happens <laughs> when you land on free parking and this is my point when people say, why do I need a contract in writing? Think of every business deal you do as playing a game. Mm -hmm. The written contract is the rules of the game. And you might think you know how to play Monopoly because you've been playing it at your house your whole life. And then you get to somebody's house and you put $500 in the middle of the board because that's the way you were taught to do it. And it turns out that you're wrong. But... If, and, and now you have an argument. And you know how you avoid arguments? You know how you avoid crappy situations as an artist with the people you do a deal with? Is when you put things in writing, even a simple writing, so that you all have a common document to look at that tells you how things are going to go down. And so that is my plea to the creators out there. <laughs> to get your deals, even the simplest ones, in writing. N not because it makes it more likely that you're going to have an argument, because, but more that it reduces the risk of having an argument. When you have everything laid out, you have less to fight about later. And, um, you know, get out of here with what you said earlier, Lauren. The rules are so <laughs> clear about this. Like, don't make me look up the rules of Monopoly. Fight, fight, <laughs> fight. No, just kidding. <laughs> oh, so, my gosh. That is really funny. And a now, very granted, good Shakespeare that's, said it a lot better than I did. Yeah. That's, but that's also why you need to have the communication with the people you're currently working with, right? Because those rules do change and evolve over time. So you can't, go, well, obviously we're going to split it 50 50. That's what you do. That's what it was in the other contract I read. It's like, no, each. Each game you play is going to be whatever the team you're playing with or, you know, the group of people you're playing with agree upon. 
So it's important to, if you're playing Monopoly, have that discussion before you're two rounds in and then you land on free parking and go, where's my money? And you go, why didn't we talk about this before the game? What, you only want it now because you're on that spot. Yeah. yeah. Talk this to is each a, other. Getting get some also- rough childhood flashbacks here. That is, yeah, I was going to say this. Uh, I feel like that's a really good comparison to like co writing, too, though, because sometimes you go into a co write and you're just like, oh, we'll figure it out at the end. And then the end comes and you're like, I wrote most of the song. And they're like, no, I wrote most of the song. So, oh, yeah. a good example of just deciding to go 50 50 or deciding how you're going to decide at the Thank end. you, Katie Zaccardi. That is a fantastic example of this principle right (laughs) when two songwriters get together you should always have a written agreement for how the proceeds of that song are going to be divided and what you can do with that song we commonly refer to that as a split sheet Mm -hmm. and a lot of songwriters don't use split sheets they just say hey we'll figure it out or they might even say to themselves look we're just going to split this 50 50 we don't need a written document for that well let me ask you this how are you going to decide how the song's going to be exploited? Does every person get to find their own opportunities for the song that you wrote? Does everybody have to agree? That's the kind of stuff that can go into a split sheet. And if you don't have that stuff in writing, you're left with the common law rules, and that's going to create a lot of fights later. So even the simplest of deals, you get them in writing, you save a lot of headaches later, and you... And you reduce the likelihood of getting screwed over later. Because in the split sheet context, I've seen this all the time, where you might write a song with somebody, Katie, and you think for sure, okay, this was Mm 50-50. And then one day that person comes out of the woodwork and says, oh, we agreed on 75-25. It's like, no, we didn't. So yes, we did. You and I were sitting in the studio and you said, oh, I only want 25% of the song because you're the real songwriter on this. And you don't have any written document that says otherwise. So yeah. get it in writing. Do you send your clients like a, a little thing to use? Or do you recommend that they like specify specific things on a split sheet? Yes. When I work with a client, like in fact, even when I work with a client that brings me in for nothing to do with songwriting, I almost always wind up giving them my split sheet template. Yeah. Because they're saying, oh, I'm writing a song with somebody. And I'll say, you got a split sheet? And they're like, what's that? And I'm like, all right, sending you this. Yeah. Now, in modern times, this has gotten... And, and, and by the way, I sympathize with songwriters who... Like, nothing makes the songwriting session less cool than Literally. the person who brings out the ink and paper. Hey, we got to get a split sheet for this. Yeah, I know. It kills the vibe. Thankfully, technology has saved the day with this a little bit. There are some fantastic apps out there. Uh, the first that pops off the top of my head is one called Song Splits that does all of this digitally. And so instead of bringing in a literal piece of paper, a literal split sheet, you can create this app that does your split sheet electronically. Everybody just pulls out their phones and says, okay, we all agree to this. You you know, tap something that says you agree. And that's a lot cooler yeah. than, you know, getting out a piece of paper and everybody signing it. And then you lose that piece of paper. So you have no way of proving anything. Split sheet sends it to everybody. It's digitally backed up. So, you know, it's, it's uh, preserved for all of history. Yeah. See, technology saving the day, making, making collaboration with written documents. Cool. Again, we love it. <laughs> you know what? Do we have time for me to just tell a quick, funny thing? We always have time for quick funny things with Katie's account. <laughs> Whatever else funny, we but... have gets put aside. I was I... doing what I always do, which is scrolling on TikTok, and I came across an SNL skit about checks. And I saw this... this! I saw this today on TikTok! It must be making the rounds. Yes, <laughs> please regale us with this. This was such a funny sketch. <laughs> and it just, like, it reminds me of just, like, exactly this, but, like, with split sheets. So the sketch is basically <laughs> just, like... That is like two people at dinner and then they're like, oh, I'll get the check. The one guy puts down his card and the girl's like, oh, I'll Venmo you right now. And he's like, great, I just got it. And then it goes into this like ad montage for checks. Yeah. And it's like, why, why do that when you could write out a check to someone checks. and then fling it to them with your hand? Like, yeah. And then it's like all this dramatic scenarios where you would yeah. use a check. Um. And uh, you got to watch it. Look it up, SNL checks. But it literally is exactly this, like bring back checks, bring back written contracts. And it's like, why do this when you only have to write the date, 
your name, the uh, <laughs> the amount, <laughs> the amount in letters, <laughs> the amount, but in letters. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> uh, and, and in the memo uh, line is where you put the secret. The secret. <laughs> So this is only this, funny to you and me. Everybody else does not know what we're talking like, about. But you have to go watch it right now. And this is, I feel like this is a split sheet. It's like, why, why use a digital app when you could write out your split name, sheet. the split, another split, the percentage, <laughs> name. your publisher information, exactly, your PRO. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Yeah, oh God, it's that's... bad. My brain only like works in TikTok videos. We need to do a parody of that SNL sketch, but about split sheets. I think that's a very I, good idea. You know, given the heightened production values of our show, we did a whole Shakespearean play just now. Like maybe we could start dabbling in a little sketch comedy. There might be Ryan, something here. Just have Chad write it for us. That's right. Put in the prompts. Give him the SNL video. I shouldn't say him because I don't want to make the AI overlord automatically mail but whatever i think i said that last time i was on here too <laughs> anyway <laughs> just give him the prompts have him write a sketch in the next week we can perform i don't know it. a piece of technology that takes over and dominates the conversation like we might True. have the right gender yeah you're right i might have made that joke last week too <laughs> anyway oh my god um okay so we got a few minutes before we go to break i wanted to uh, run other one other piece of news by you. Just see what your thought is about this. So uh, I saw this in Billboard last week, Katie, about that music streaming services are experiencing a slowdown in growth right now. And Apple Music, Amazon Music, the major DSPs are talking about something that they haven't really done in pretty much the time that they've existed for like more than a decade. And that's raised their monthly prices. Um, you know, uh, Apple Music and Amazon Music have done this a little bit. Spotify has kind of held firm with its pricing for a long time. And there's a real discussion and debate going on right now about whether it is time to raise prices. We've made no secret on this program, Katie, the fact that we don't like how low rights holders are paid by these streaming services. You put out a piece of music on Spotify, you get about six-tenths of a cent per stream, and that's assuming you owe 100 percent of the rights to your music if you work if you're with a label it could be like 15 percent of that six tenths of a cent yeah and there's just and the reason why that payment is so low is there's just not enough money in the pot with all the people that are using these streaming services and one way to solve that is to get more subscribers that are paid because spotify has a lot of free tier users that aren't uh, adding to the numerator but the other thing that could be done is to put more money in the pot. And people have been saying for a long time, $9.99, $12.99 is just not a high enough price when you think about what we're giving people, which is access to every piece of music that's ever been made, ever, ever, ever. Like, I think of it this way. Like, imagine you yeah. went back to somebody in, like, 1955, and you said to them, hey, are you enjoying that Jan and Dean record that you're playing on your record player? Uh, what if I told you I could give you a little rectangle that <laughs> could, by just by talking to it, play any song that's ever been created ever at the touch of your hand? You don't have to change records. You don't have to buy anything new. You don't have to make any new copies. How much would you pay for that? And somebody in 1955 would say a, 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 a trillion dollars. Like, because yeah. that's so incredible when you think about it in the abstract. Yeah. And we still charge $9.99 a month if you're Spotify. And so yeah. is it high time to raise these prices? Okay. Like I want to say yes and I want to say no because I I have never really looked into what Spotify's breakdown is, but where my brain is going right now and you and I have talked about this before is like the million dollar deals that Spotify was doing with like Joe Rogan's podcast and with um Meghan Markle's podcast and stuff like that. So oh, yeah. for me, I'm like that money can't conceptually with and the, with all their staff like they can't be making that much money just off of consumers it has to be from businesses and ads and stuff like that i'm imagining so part of me is like can't they just like um do better in their business model and maybe charge <laughs> businesses and ads and whatnot more instead of making us pay for it 
But I also agree with you that like it is an insanely low price tag. And I'm sure that there's a little wiggle room for even just a couple dollars more a month to like have that make big waves. At the end of the day, I think benefiting the songwriters is like what I want most. But I'm also thinking like as a consumer, I don't want it to go way up. And and just in general, like how can they also achieve what they want to achieve without having us to pay for it? You know what I mean? I hear that. Um, and I and I don't mean to suggest that like that there isn't a legit other side to this, right? Um, you know, the, the, the article talks a lot about some of the very serious risks to DSPs raising their prices. Like consumers are price sensitive and there are a lot of yeah. free options to consuming music, right? There are a lot of people who are paying nine ninety nine on Spotify right now that if the price went up, they would just go, well, I guess I'm just going to go find music on YouTube for free. <laughs> Cause like I'm not paying. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's extra steps to get the song that I love, but you know, I have to watch a commercial, but you know, I can't pay more. And so that, yeah, a loss of subscriber in- growth, that's that's a real issue. Yeah. I mean, because part of me too was like, maybe just make the free version like so annoying that <laughs> people <laughs> like are more inclined to pay for it. But um, but maybe those people would go to YouTube. I mean, I think no matter what, there's always gonna be a subset of people who just don't want to pay or cannot pay, no matter if it's $2 a month, $10, 15, 30, they're just like not going to do it. Um, I think that there's also maybe opportunities. Like, I don't know if title is still doing this. My dad is very much like an audiophile. Mm-hmm. And I remember when title was first coming out and when a lot of the streaming services were still new, he was curious about title because they charged more, but it was like higher quality, uh, audio. Yeah. And so it's like, maybe they could do something like that where there's a higher tier, and it's better quality and like it people have options so all in all i agree with you i think that we are paying a significantly low price for a pretty amazing service when you do think of it but they also set a certain precedent and it's gonna be hard to just try to like switch that up on people especially now when every price of everything is raising and people are cutting costs you know I'm not going to lie, Katie. I kind of liked your first suggestion to like solve Spotify's problem here by making the free tier like so inhospitable that people start paying for the service. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking bully them into for it. every song that you listen to on the free tier of Spotify, you have to listen to audio of me reciting Shakespeare, followed by <laughs> producer Lauren explaining the rules of free parking in Monopoly. And we're going to yeah. get 100% subscription adoption on Spotify 100%. tomorrow. They'd be like, <laughs> I cannot do this anymore, except for me. And I would say, I just want to listen to Ryan do Shakespeare all oh, day. So. <laughs> bless you, Katie Zuccardi. Let's take a quick break for ourselves. We're going to be bringing in Tony Glazer and Summer Crockett more right next to here on Break the Business. Ryan Carella here. I hope you're enjoying the show and I hope that you're getting a lot out of it. I do what I do because I care about creators like you. A lot. I've dedicated my career to helping creative professionals, entrepreneurs, and organizations move forward. I do it by hosting this program, and I'm also proud to do it in my legal practice. If you're a creative professional looking for solutions-oriented legal services to help you further your goals, I'd love to help. My firm RKPA does contracts, commercial law, copyright, trademark, and more. Visit rkpalaw.com to learn more. That's rkpalaw.com. Ryan A. Carella, PA, Miami, Florida. Streaming services for Break the Business provided by L.E.K. Entertainment. L.E.K. Entertainment is a full-service entertainment company offering everything from consultations to full-scale events and productions, including audio and video productions, voiceovers, staged theatrical productions, script and music development, and streaming services. For more information, visit lekentertainment.com. L.E.K. Entertainment wants to help you bring your story to life. Thanks for supporting Break the Business. If you have a question or topic that you want us to discuss, email us at breakthebusiness at gmail.com. You can follow the host, that's me, on Twitter at Ryan K-A-I-R, and you can follow the show at the BTB Podcast. 
Be sure to subscribe to the show on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and on all major podcast platforms. And now, let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Break the Business, you lovely humans. Ryan Carella here with Katie Zaccardi, having just a grand old time on all major streaming services, podcast platforms, and Sirius XM 145. Much love to Slam Radio for giving us a satellite radio home. Katie, before we bring in our guest, could you tell us a little bit about the new program you got coming out? You were telling me about it before the show started. I feel like we got to share this pretty cool opportunity with the world. Yeah. So the program is my group program audience builder, and it actually has been around for quite some time, but it just got a little facelift or it's about to get facelift. So it's a program that helps you create your brand, figure out who your ideal audience is, and then craft and implement your social media strategy so that you can grow online. Whether it is on Ryan and I's favorite app, like TikTok or Instagram, YouTube, we do it all. And we'll teach you how to Put in place a social media strategy that actually attracts fans that will buy from you, come to your shows, all that juicy stuff. So like I said, we've had the program for a little bit, but now that I just finished my certification, we are updating it with some like EFT, hypnosis videos, stuff like that. So that the mindset section and part of it is like even juicier. And every year I just do updates to it anyway, because social media platforms change. So we're going to have some new guest speakers and just general updates happening now. Um, And so you can, we do those live, like we do live calls for it. So when you join now through Friday, the 14th of April, you can get $300 off, which is pretty dope. And people can find this by visiting dot, dot, dots. KatieZaccardi.com slash the dash audience dash builder. And uh, if you can't find it or you have questions, you can just DM me on Instagram at Katie Zaccardi and I'll send it to you. So exciting. All right. Our guests this week are film producers and the founders of the Below the Line Boot Camp, a free not-for-profit program dedicated to providing underserved and at-risk individuals with training to launch their careers in the film industry. You can find out more by visiting www.choicefilms.com slash BTL dash bootcamp. We are happy to welcome Tony Glazer and Summer Crockett Moore on to break the business. Hello to you both. Well, hey there. How are you? Hey, guys. Oh, God, they look like film producers, too. So cool. (laughs) Oh, man, they got like the cool room behind them. And I'm not just buttering them up because they're film producers. And, you know, (laughs) I'm trying to get my Shakespeare project made. (laughs) Very impressive. I love the uh, the, the blanket. Very awesome. (laughs) So what are you thinking? Three picture deal, you know, option for a fourth. Yes. We'll we'll have my people call your people. Three soliloquy deal. (laughs) <laughs> Shakespeare's back in again. You know, it's it's cyclical yeah. with the film business. I think it's time for another resurgence. Yeah. Um, so to the fantastic work that you all are doing in the nonprofit space, in the helping people space, in the creating opportunity space, which of course puts you in a special space in our hearts, let's talk a little bit about the Below the Line Boot Camp which again provides underserved and at-risk individuals with training to give them careers in the -the below-the-line professions in the film industry. What a great cause. What gave you all the idea to launch this program? Um, You know, it's an interesting thing. We always had internships um, from our company's 21 years old. We always had internships, but when we moved our base of business to Newburgh, New York, we found ourselves in a community that had a ton of people that were interested in film, but they didn't have a pathway there. Um, They weren't college bound. They weren't coming out of film schools. They didn't have parents or uncles in the business. And we had this amazing community of people wanting to be involved without a way to do it. So it became a program that developed from the community desire to be involved yeah. and our desire to work within the community. And it just kind of grew from there. Yeah. It was, it was, it was sort of a way for us to, to, to signal to people that there was something in it for them, that they could be a part of it, that the film business was not just the circus coming to town and then leaving behind a mess that they, they had a real interest in it. And if they wanted to be a part of it, they, they certainly could. And, you know, it's tough what you were saying earlier about it being a closed door. It is a closed door. And we, we certainly endeavor to, to keep that door open uh, for people who have an interest in it, it's it's a tough business. It's not easy to get into it. There's pitfalls along the way. In a in a tip of the a hat to Shakespeare, when sorrows come, they come not in single spies, but in battalions. Ooh. And that is that. 
it's that is man. it. That is that is what the business can be like when yeah. it rain, when it rains, it pours. And so we endeavor to sort of try to help bridge that. And then once people get on set, uh, we we really want to mentor them and, and try to point them in the right direction. Absolutely. Now you're just showing off <laughs> the. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit more about the Hudson Valley area. Can you can you give us a little bit more about the impact that your boot camp has had on this area where the program is headquartered? I mean, it sounds like you're sort of you're almost you're almost building like a, a whole film industry there. You know, it's interesting that you say that when we showed up in 2017, we found Newburgh and one of the sound stages uh, that we now manage was there and it, we found it on a Google search. And the minute Tony and I landed there, it was like we were coming home. It is yeah. such an incredible, incredible place for artists in general, um, but makers, filmmakers, um, all sorts of, of uh, incredible film and television opportunities. Um, it was it was ripe for the picking. And what we found almost immediately upon moving our offices there was that not only was there a workforce that was ripe for development, but that there were people who had been there for years waiting for uh, the light to turn on. Yeah, and not just waiting for it, planning. There was a lot. There were a lot of people that came before us that were Absolutely. instrumental in uh, getting the uh, tax credit, the bump in our region for that. There are, are we we manage sound stages, umber stages, uh, for the owner Ted During. Ted had the sort of foresight. Uh, and, and real, just real vision to sort of put a soundstage in Newburgh yeah. uh, when no one thought that was going to be a good idea. And since then, we've gone from one uh, to to soon to be six. And so it's 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 really become a mecca. And we certainly are the beneficiaries of really everybody in the region really trying to get people to know more and more about about Hudson Valley. Absolutely. <laughs> And just the quality of life there. I mean, so Tony and I worked and lived in Manhattan and, and in Jersey on the edge of Manhattan for years. And while that was thriving and exciting in our 20s, you know, by 35, I was like, whoa, this hooker's tired, <laughs> really tired. And by 40, I was like, I need a yard and I need a garden and I need a nap. Yeah. <laughs> so Pretty much. so Pretty much. the Hudson Valley is, um, it's been incredible in that way. And so I just feel really lucky and, um, and fortunate to have such a, a fantastic community around us. Mm -hmm. And that lifts us up and allows us to, uh, to, you know, give back. Yeah. What's the day-to-day -day training like for the participants in their, pro in your program? Like what, I, what is their, what's their every day? I assume it's very hands-on from the way you're describing I, it. It's, I mean, it, the, the program is exactly as it sounds. I mean, it is boot camp. We give them anywhere between two to four days. We give them a crash course on what it means to live, like in work, the classroom thrive first. in the classroom, what it means to live, work, thrive on a film set as a production assistant. And that just runs the gamut from reading a call sheet to knowing how to work, operate a walkie, how to be on a walkie, how to be on a set. And then after that, we literally put them on a film shoot, uh, giving them a job. They literally go from this free program to getting paid. Uh, to, to train, be, to train wow. and to be on a set and to learn it firsthand. We trained 137 people last year and we did it with sponsorship from New York State work for, to, Workforce Development Program mm -hmm. from the city of Newburgh. They have a block grant for mm -hmm. the community that they give, the Orange County Film and Tourism Office, uh, Umbra Stages contributed. And so a lot of people came together to allow us to provide this training. Um, all of our teachers are working union members and we have people who have been on the sets of White House Plumbers, Poker Face, The Whale. The whale. Yeah. We have nine people on set with us now. We're actually in yeah. Atlantic City on a job. This is our hotel room. <laughs> so, we'll have work, we'll travel. Yeah. Um, and of the 137 that we've trained, 20 are either on work permits for the union or have joined the mm -hmm. union. So uh, we're just ecstatic about, about the growth yeah. of the program. Yeah, and we have to say also that not just working um, uh, union members uh, come and teach classes. We actually have our boot camp graduates who have gone on to, to starting their careers come back and teach so that they can let everybody know that it's a real thing, yeah. that they can do this, that you can build a career for yourself. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a long shot. And are there plans to scale this? Because like I, I love what's happening in the Hudson Valley. That sounds amazing. And I can think of a ton of other communities, uh, perhaps a lot of former industrial towns that need to kind of reinvent themselves yeah. that would really benefit from this kind of programming. I mean, I, you both seem very busy, but like, can we see this in other cities too? 
<laughs> you know, it's interesting. We just have started applying for federal grants, um, and there are some incredible HUD programs that work with underserved communities yeah. um, because these jobs are um, immediate. They are long term. They are mostly union. Even the stepping stones mm -hmm. are. So I absolutely think it's scalable and um, and applicable to be transferred from place to place. Yeah. And it's not, and honestly, you know, it's it, what we're doing. This is our way of giving back. It's something that we want to do. It's something we enjoy doing. It feeds us by doing it. But to be perfectly honest, us giving back is actually giving back towards the film industry by, by building a film crew base, yeah. by really by allowing people to, to, to grow in this industry, which means more for us having a crew base in Hudson Valley means there'll be a crew base already there. So more people will want to come. And so we really want to build that out. So as much as we're helping, it's helping us. It really is a two way street. Absolutely. And I think it's important to call out that, um, you know, this is nothing against film schools. This is nothing against college degrees. Um, I happen to have gotten, I'm from a very rural community in Tennessee. I moved to New York at 17. I had a, a acting scholarship, um, but I got into a very prestigious school that I could not afford. And that cost more than my parents' house for, you know, two years of college. So I was not able to go there. And I thought, oh, this is it. I'm never, I'm never going to make it. And what I realized was, because I had the determination and I wasn't going to let one closed door stall me, it was really me putting myself out there in a way to say, I'll do anything. I'll get coffee for whoever. Um, the doors are open if you have the right attitude mm -hmm. and are willing to work and climb that ladder. It's you don't have to go to a very expensive school to have a film career. Yeah. I don't have any degree and I've been working since I'm you know, 18. I also think so. it's worth noting that um, we have um, graduates who have gone on to a film set and went, nope, too loud for me. And literally <laughs> didn't, didn't like it and wanted out of it. And, and, you know, can you imagine spending a lot of money in film school, getting on a film set and going, that wasn't for you? Right. You know, that wasn't the place that you wanted to be. And so it's really a way to shortcut that. Not that there's anything wrong with school. Not that I'm saying Love there's something school. wrong with higher education. I think those things, all those things are great. So I support those wholeheartedly. But but we we want people to, to, to know what we're pitching and to immediately know what it feels like immediately get out there, see it for themselves so that they can make their own decisions, empower themselves, create ultimately their own content, their own independent space, do the things that they want to do exactly. and know that they have a say in the, in, in the trajectory of their own careers. Katie, are you as blown away by this as I am? <laughs> I am. This sounds amazing. And I'm actually curious, do you, how do you, how would you say the film industry is doing right now? Because it sounds like it's thriving, but as someone who went into music and, you know, we talk about this on you know, this podcast, but I think it's normal for people to, to discourage others from going into the arts in general, whether that's music sure. or film or just entertainment in general, it feels risky. It feels like you can't get a job when people don't know about it. So what is your take on that? I think it's a very interesting time because we have a glut of content, right? There's so many streaming platforms and so much content and thousands and thousands of movies made you know, every year they're submitted. Um, so it's, it's exciting and scary at the same time in my perspective. Um, what I would say is that something that we try to tell everybody that we, that we train up or mentor is that you have to be ready to pivot, right? I'm a member of four unions. Tony's a member of four different unions. I you know, had a thriving career as a, a voiceover actor that the minute technology grew, my career changed instantly um, because there, were more, there was more competition and more opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so I was pivoting then going, oh, okay, so now I'm going to also look at this opportunity and this opportunity. So I think if you're flexible, and you're excited about storytelling in a broad way, right? Like I love being in front of the camera, but I equally love being behind the scenes, running around mm -hmm. in the producing field. So if you're a person that has interest in a lot of different sectors, I think there's a very good chance you'll have a long career. If you're a person that needs instant security, you know, it's a bit of a gamble, but I think it's worth it yeah. because I mean, we've been working pretty steadily for 20 years, but it's, it's the constant ability to pivot as the industry yeah. grows. Yeah. I would say that that, you know? I would say that that's, that's absolutely true. And I, I think that in answer to the, 
the, the main question, which is, is this a good time to, to be in the business right now? Is this a good time to do this? And I said, if you're a storyteller, at least creatively, because we're storytellers, I'm a storyteller. I think any time is a good time to be in the business. And you, yeah. you, you decide for yourself how you want to be in it. And then you make a decision for yourself. How am I going to pivot? How am I going to figure out how to stay in this business? And for us, it was deciding to wear as many hats as possible so that we could always be near it. We could always be in it and then always circle back to the things that we want to do. And so you do make your own way. It's up to you. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a gig life, which can be daunting. Um, you, you go from job to job to job, but the plus side of it is that every job you have, you're auditioning for the next one and you're networking yeah. and you're meeting people and uh, you're building your own resume and you're learning how to survive in the business, which, which, which is in the same in any business. And so I think all these, I think the business, any business has its peaks, it has its valleys, it has its ups, it has its down, and you have to figure out how you survive in it. And um, if you if you really want to do it, if it's in you to do it, you'll you'll figure it out. People will people will find a way uh, to do that. Yeah. So to me, the, the film business, much like the arts in general, is more democratized than it's ever been. Right. There's more content coming out from more sources. You don't just need the big media companies putting out the content anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened with that is that there is more educational content out there to help prepare people for there was fields on the talent side, right? There is no shortage of podcasts, radio shows like this one, books, mm -hmm. courses that like Katie creates that helps people in the talent roles, mm -hmm. the people in front of the camera, the people on the microphone take advantage of this career of these careers. What I don't see enough of are programs like yours, Tony and mm -hmm. summer that are providing this democratized education for people who want to have the below the line roles. 100%. And because all these productions are going to need those people too. And it sounds well, like we have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> you know, honestly, the, the, I, I know that there's, there are flashier parts of this, of this business and this job and these productions, but a grip is just as important as, um, as a director, you know, somebody, uh, somebody in electrics, somebody in wardrobe, you know, somebody in props is just as important. If they're not doing their job, the thing tends to fall apart. Yes. You know, you lose it. Everybody has a hand in this. Everybody is important to this. It takes a village. It takes an army village to make a movie. You know, everybody has to pull together. And I think I think our point is to let everybody know, even as a PA, that you have a role, you have a job. And if you don't do that job, something's going to suffer. It's not going to go unnoticed because everybody is a part of the whole to make this happen. Some are a little flashier. Some are a little more exciting. Some of the things that people maybe gravitate towards. But all of these jobs are critical. All these jobs are important. And we um, call it um, we call it a film family because, you know, We've like been that. on sets. We've been on sets in our lives uh, that shall remain nameless, where it was brutal. Yeah. Like there was a lot of stress and a lot of you know vitriol. And we try to build an environment that when even things are going wrong, it's still like, all right, guys, we're yeah. in this together. We're a team. It's loving. Yeah. And I think that um, the industry as a whole is shifting more towards kindness and equality and diversity I hope and. So. Uh, it looks very different than it did 10 years ago. And yeah. I can only imagine 10 years from now, it's going to continue. That's my hope. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's a perfect time for people to explore it and know that, you know, my mom and dad said to me at 17, what's the worst that could happen? You get there, you don't like it. There's a plane ticket mm -hmm. home, you know? So yeah. take the risk is what I think. I, I think you should take the risk too. And, and we try to make our a Somerset film family, which is so true. We try to make it a family and we try to keep it a community and we try to make it fun for ourselves and we try to keep it kind and good, uh, you know, because then I'll spend 80 hours a week working and it won't be a job. And I don't, and I don't, and honestly, I don't want a job. Dirty, dirty ponytail. I don't, Tuesday, I, don't, guys. I don't want a job. I've had enough of those. I'd rather do this. Yeah. Now, Summer, I know you said you weren't going to name names. Can you name one name? Can you name one vitriolic <laughs> environment where you're on? Just yeah. between you, me, and the 33 million Sirius oh, XM exactly. subscribers. Come on. <laughs> we can you. never get the guests to name names around here. I think, it, I think but I think, it, but I think, you know, I think some, some, somewhere along the way when it goes in the negative direction, when it becomes less fun, uh, the work suffers. And, and, yeah. and I, yeah. I think at the end of the day, anybody that wants to be in content has to sort of praise and prize and value the quality of the work they put in. And for that, you need the right environment yeah. uh, and the right people on every level.
And I think at the micro level that matters too. Um, if you, and you can, you can speak to this more than I can, but I would imagine a below the line person who gets a reputation of being negative, of being a, a drain on the family, of being difficult to work with. Right. That's, you know, not a person that gets to work in this industry very long. Conversely, if you bring a positive attitude to the workplace, that's something that will get you more jobs. Uh, they will, you know, word, word gets around. So as part of your program, are you teaching your students a lot yeah. about positive attitude being yeah. a, a, a net positive yes. on the proceedings? Yes, 100 percent. You know, I think I think one thing that can be lost because the business seems so big and unwieldy and enormous. It's small. It's a small community. And if you do well, people hear about it. And if you don't do well, people hear about it. Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's it's true. And so again, every job that you have auditions to the next, auditions for the next job. And I know so many people who do well on one set and are invited onto another set by somebody else because they like the job that they did and the work that they did. Yep. And they like the attitude that they have. It goes so far. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I truly believe there are people that I think of today that um that had the best attitude maybe they weren't the best worker or they weren't the most trained or the most seasoned but their attitude was so special that you spend the extra time with them to help lift them up and that it to me is almost more important than the work itself because having a person who's doing their best and being kind at the same time I will take the extra time to train them yeah. um versus the person who may have the most fantastic you know, end result, but it's just heinous. <laughs> like life is short and careers are shorter. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's just enjoy our time together and do something special. And every once in a while, you get those people like Katie Zaccardi who bring the positive <laughs> attitude and yeah. the talent. And those people are unicorns. You got to keep them around as long as you can. That you can find, find out more about our guest work by visiting choicefilms.com slash BTL dash bootcamp. Tony and Summer, this has been a pleasure. Before we let you go, I'm going to ask each of you our final question. We will start with Summer on this one. Summer, do you have any last tips for the indie creators out there to help them move their careers forward? Yes, I would say it is not going to be easy, but it is going to be worth it. So when you find yourself walking up against what feels like a closed door, think of the industry as a big house and you know there's a garage door, a back door, a side door, a ladder to climb. Don't give up because it will work out if it's meant to work out for you. So just keep your chin up and keep going. Tony, same question. Bring us home. I would tell you that if, if this is something you really want to do, if this is something that's important to you, then uh, then find out what you want to say, why you want to say it, and say it as much times. Never let anybody tell you not to say it. And ultimately, if you feel yourself on the outside without a community, find your community. Make your community. Bring people together together be stronger in numbers. You will all rise together and eventually break through this wall that you're finding out uh, really has a lot of open windows to be snuck in through to steal summers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not time. Hollywood unless we're stealing the people's ideas. I understand. <laughs> my my <laughs> neck hurts from nodding so much, guys. <laughs> you guys Fan are awesome. Thank you. Thank right back at you. Please don't be a stranger, gang. All right. Keep us posted on what you're doing. We'd love to have you on again real oh, soon. Love you. Thank you. We love it. Thank you. Come visit us on set. Woohoo. Yes. yes <laughs> absolutely. All right. Uh, Katie. Before we close this week, you briefly mentioned as part of uh, your your program that's uh, available now, you mentioned something briefly about hypnosis. I know you've said in the past that you're working on your hypnosis certification. Does this mean like you're a hypnotist yes. now? I'm not a hypnotist. <laughs> so I would say basically what I'm certified in is like called hypnotherapy. So it's different from stage hypnosis. I wouldn't call myself a hypnotist. I don't know if there actually is a difference, but can Katie hypnotize right now? Yes. So basically <laughs> what I do is tapping into the like subconscious mind to help kind of program it with suggestions. So unlike what you see on stage where someone's like balk like a chicken and then you do it, it's more about just putting you into a really relaxed state and then like I said, programming in suggestions of like, if you're like, I want to be really successful and I want to feel like super confident and whatever, we can do a hypnosis, which really just looks like a deep meditation. And as part of that, I will say those things so that your brain begins to believe them as true. So you don't feel hypnotized 
necessarily you feel in full control if and you keep your morals so if i were to say like rob a bank if that's not like morally good for you you're not gonna do that even though i said it when you were in a hypnotherapy session it <laughs> is it's only so like you are conscious like you are aware it's really just like a deep meditation but it speaks to your subconscious mind to kind of reprogram it that's amazing it's really cool that's yeah. so so cool does it work over Zoom? Is that like something you could do on the air? Like, does it take a long time? Would we eat up a whole show of you trying to hypnotize me? What What would this be like in practice? I think to get the best out of it, we would need like 15 to 20 minutes of a show to do it. But um, yeah, I can do it. Essentially, I'd say, I mean, we could talk about it before too, or if, if viewers, listeners want to write in and talk about some goals that they have or like some ways that they want to feel music industry goals. We would just need to decide on like, what is the goal of this hypnosis? Like what do people want to get out of listening to this? And then, um, I would do it. And basically it would just be almost like a, like I said, a meditation and I'll just like guide you through it and you can do it with me, Ryan. Like you can sit back, relax. And then so can the listeners. So yeah, we can do that next time if you want. Meditation always makes for good radio, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can, we, can we group him? Like, can you hypnotize the audience as it were? Like if this is Mass kind hypnosis. of a good, yeah, if everyone, well, it's like if, if everybody listening was in the same kind of an exercise, it would be a yeah. little different. I feel like well, that, that's I mean, like what comic book supervillains do. <laughs> Well, that's why I say like, oh. we would just want to pick what it is because it wouldn't be like, okay, Ryan wants to like have his law career skyrocket because the listeners aren't going to resonate with that. But if we're doing something that's more general about, you know, hitting your goals or feeling a certain way or overcoming certain blocks and it's more general, it would apply to everyone. And it would just be like, like if the two of you were here with me and I did it, you would both just have your own experiences listening to what I'm saying and you would get the same results. All right, let's workshop this. There might One be one month there, from there. now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> our, our thanks to Tony Glazer and Summer Crockett. More our thanks to Katie Zaccardi, producer Lauren. Thanks to all of you viewers and listeners for checking out Break the Business. We will see you next week.